on this Saturday night. Holiday concern over COVID-19. We need everybody to have turned off your COVID switch. You need to turn it back on and pay careful attention. How the virus could spoil gatherings on the first long weekend without restrictions. Ukraine's resistance. We're fighting for our very existence and for our future as independent countries, as independent nation. Russia's relentless offensive in the ruins of Mariupol and why many nations are choosing to remain neutral. Preparing for a heartbreaking homecoming. I've come to terms with the fact that my life will never be the same. Ukrainian scientists stuck in Antarctica are heading back amid a worsening war and deadly Durban disaster with hundreds already killed. South Africa braces for more flooding as rains restart in the east. Global National reporting tonight. Nitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The first significant holiday weekend with few restrictions is underway right as COVID-19's sixth wave sweeps across Canada. With so many on the move, the concern is holiday infections will drive up cases and hospitalizations. Evidence suggests there is already accelerated transmission due to new and highly infectious Omicron subvariants. As Mike Drolet reports, experts are urging Canadians to remain vigilant and be careful during holiday gatherings. Two, one, go! It's official now. The COVID pause on annual traditions is over. Three years have passed since many young Canadians joined the hunt for Easter eggs, gathered for Passover dinner, or went to the mosque for Ramadan. And you can tell how much it was missed. We feel like there's been an excessive amount of pent-up demand for the community to get back together, be involved with one another, and be in person. I'll look the other way. It was only a year ago Ontario Premier Doug Ford declared a state of emergency amidst COVID's third wave, when the province's health care system was struggling to keep up. Now, with most restrictions, including mask mandates lifted, Canadians are flipping between caution as of right now, we're still getting together, but we're kind of playing it by ear. We'll see. A couple of the family members are sick, so they might be sitting it out. An all-out fatigue. Most people I'm friends with, them, like my family and stuff, just haven't really been looking because they're kind of tired from it. That weariness has health experts worried. They've tracked the growth of the current sixth wave through a rise in a manageable number of hospitalizations. But with the Omicron subvariant BA2 being far more transmissible, the actual number of cases in the community is believed to be enormous. Too many people have, you know, once we lifted the restrictions, it's basically COVID's death. Well, I'm sorry, COVID is not done with us. So we need everybody, if you've turned off your COVID switch, you need to turn it back on and pay careful attention. Epidemiologists expect COVID numbers will wane through the spring and summer and are hopeful no new variant emerges. But masks, they say, are still a smart move in crowded settings. I don't see uh, the reasoning behind trying to remove as many protections as we can as quickly as we can. It makes no sense to me. It's an emotional response, not a scientific one. Was a restriction-free long weekend the right decision? We won't know that answer for a few weeks. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. It is a massive travel weekend right across the U.S. as well. The U.S. has extended its federal mask mandate for another 15 days until May 3rd, requiring people to wear masks on planes, trains, and in transit hubs. There are fears a substantial surge is just around the corner. In New York City, health officials say the two Omicron subvariants are fueling significant community transmission. 20 states, including the entire Northeast, have seen daily case numbers jump by at least 30% in the last two weeks after a two-month decline. More cities across China are locking down as cases explode. Streets are completely empty in Shanghai. China's largest city suffering a record 3,500 cases in just 24 hours. Most of Shanghai's 25 million residents remain under strict lockdown as case counts accelerate. Residential buildings are being converted into quarantine centers to house the explosion of new infections. Under China's COVID-0 policy, everyone who tests positive must quarantine at a designated facility. 
Toronto police say five men were injured overnight in a drive-by shooting that they called a random act of violence. Officers say a suspect opened fire at a group of Muslim men who were gathered in a parking lot shortly after finishing midnight prayer service. All five were treated in hospital for injuries, although none are said to be life-threatening. Police say the suspect fled the scene in a blue car, but further details remain unclear. Officers stress it's too early to confirm a motive. Now to Ukraine, where officials are urging residents of Kyiv not to return home today as the capital region comes under renewed fire from Russian forces. The latest attacks come as the UN's Human Rights Commission delivers a grim update. More than 1,900 civilians are now estimated to have died since the war broke out. More than 160 of them children. Reggie Cicchini looks at the latest Russian offensive that's targeting major cities across the country. And a warning, some of the images in this story are disturbing. This is a grim sign in a city hanging by a thread. Russia claiming it's in control of a steel plant in Mariupol, one of the last remaining outposts of the Ukrainian forces in that city. An attack on a makeshift military installation that resulted in civilian loss. Russians uh, have shown that they are willing to use anything and everything to try and subjugate our country. Russia now claims it's cleared all Ukrainian troops from Mariupol, and if so, it would mark a first victory. If confirmed, Kyiv says that would end talks with Moscow. But the military push still continues across besieged Luhansk, while shelling proved deadly in Kharkiv, hitting an administrative building. The blast wave partially damaged nearby buildings, including an apartment, this official says. Moscow has threatened to increase its attacks. Possible retaliation for the sinking of a warship, the Kremlin claims, was due to a fire. In Lviv, the Easter and Passover weekend brought new threats, where it's reported Russian missiles were taken out by the country's air defense system. And for us, there is no question here. We're fighting for our very existence and for our future. Fighting that's earned soldiers the respect of their president, who awarded them medals on Saturday for bravery in the past against the agony of the present. We put a photo of him there. He was always smiling, says this mother, whose son died fighting for Ukraine. She's afraid Russia will return and destroy this graveyard in Trotsienest, one dotted with landmines. Unthinkable atrocities are now an everyday thought, with more than 900 civilians already recovered from mass graves around Kyiv. Now, under the threat of a more intense fight in the east, lies the evergreen request for more weapons from the west. Hundreds of millions of dollars worth are being sent this weekend, but officials in the United States fear that could be expended within days of arrival. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. Canada pledged this week to send up to 150 troops to neighboring Poland in an effort to ramp up humanitarian support for the millions of Ukrainians fleeing the war. Some 100 armed forces members are already on their way, but this week on the West Bloc, Mercedes Stevenson looks at the growing calls for Ottawa and other Western nations to do more. Mercedes? Nithu, the apparent war crimes the world is bearing witness to in Ukraine have a haunting familiarity for retired Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who was in command of the UN mission in Rwanda during the genocide in that country. General Dallaire does not mince his words on the West's failure to act more decisively in Ukraine. The West has learned absolutely nothing. Dallaire says it is unclear whether what is happening right now is in fact genocide in Ukraine. That would mean that it's directed by the Russian state, or whether the atrocities are being committed by rogue Russian commanders. But he believes that determining the answer to that is vital and says that investigators must get on the ground in Ukraine as soon as possible to figure that out. Dallaire believes the West has a moral obligation to act in support of Ukraine and says it will be judged by its failures. The international community signed up that if there is a genocide, we all have a responsibility to stop it, to stop it, which means to engage in stopping it, not watching it and not letting it trit, you know, hundreds of thousands like I witnessed in Rwanda with nobody coming, but in fact, to stop it. 
This week on the West Block, I'll also speak with Defence Minister Anita Anand about what more the Canadian government can and will be doing to help Ukraine. Global News has learned that Ottawa is looking at sending Canadian Army armoured vehicles to Ukraine. That could include things like tanks, labs and coyotes. Minister Anand did not deny that her government is looking at dipping into the Canadian military stocks to help Ukraine. I have nothing to announce at this time, but I will say that we are taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to ensure that we are responding effectively to the items that Minister Resnikov, my counterpart in Ukraine, has indicated Ukraine needed. Military sources say they are concerned that donating Canadian equipment will deplete the limited inventory in the Canadian Armed Forces and that donating that equipment also comes with significant complications because the Ukrainian military is not trained on how to maintain or use those specific types of armored vehicles. The military sources say they worry that those vehicles could be of limited value if they break down quickly after arriving. Nithu? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. And you can catch the full interviews with Romeo Dallaire and Anita Anand tomorrow on the West Block, right here on Global. Since the start of the war, Western leaders have been quick to condemn Russia's invasion, but many others have stayed neutral or muted, with some even blaming the West for what's happening. President Zelensky is reportedly working to court some of those countries as he looks to speak to members of the African Union in the coming days. More than half of them either voted against or abstained from a recent UN vote to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council. Redmond Shannon looks at what lies behind those decisions. The horrors of the war in Ukraine are undeniable and often unimaginable, at least to people consuming media outside of Russia. Last week's United Nations resolution successfully kicked Russia out of the UN Human Rights Council, but it was far from unanimous. 93 mostly Western or richer nations supported the resolution, 24 voted against, and 76 either weren't present to vote or abstained. Among them, South Africa. Its president has laid some blame with NATO. That its eastward expansion would lead to greater, not less, instability in the region. The world order can sometimes look different depending on perspective. There are many countries that are very dependent on Russia that have privately told us, told me very directly, um, we agree with you. Uh, but there are limits on what we can say and do. The NATO-led campaigns in Afghanistan and Libya have led to calls of hypocrisy from many developing nations. What about is all over the place here, um, and it includes uh, the Israel-Palestine issue, the, the, the issues and other interventions. Countries like Nigeria have signed arms deals with Russia after being shunned by the West over human rights concerns. India, too, relies on Russian arms. We are for dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, we are for uh, urgent cessation of violence. Delhi resisting Western pressure to take sides. The support given by the Soviet Union and then Russia uh, in the Security Council on the Kashmir issue for India has been very pivotal. The position of Russia's ally China, perhaps a factor for African nations that rely on it for investment. To see Russia on part of many countries as representing anti-colonialism, there is a conflation of anti-colonial with anti-Westernism. But Russia's critics argue this invasion is simply part of a push to re-establish its colonial conquests. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Coming up, thousands remain evacuated as early season wildfires break out across the U.S. It may be just spring, but parts of the U.S. are already seeing their fair share of wildfires. In northern Colorado, some residents have been evacuated as firefighters combat this fire that started Friday. Progress is being made to contain it. But in New Mexico, the ongoing McBride fire has already killed at least two people since it began earlier this week. That blaze has burnt down more than 200 buildings and has forced thousands to flee their homes.
Emergency services in parts of South Africa remain on high alert as more rain and damaging winds are expected in the country's flood ravaged eastern region. Torrential downpours left a trail of death and destruction around the port city of Durban earlier this week. Nearly 400 deaths have been reported, dozens remain missing and tens of thousands have been left homeless. Officials aren't expecting nearly as much rain in the coming days but warn more flooding could come as the situation worsens on the ground. Three Chinese astronauts are back on solid ground after spending six months aboard the country's newest space station. The crew landed back on Earth today in the Gobi Desert in the northern region of Inner Mongolia, nine hours after beginning their descent. The mission is the longest ever for China, which is excluded from being part of the International Space Station over U.S. fears about China's space program being run by the Communist Party's military wing. Coming up, the stranded scientists setting sail from a remote research base to their war-torn homes in Ukraine. As Russia's assault on their homeland drags on, Ukrainians around the world have had to watch the invasion with feelings of horror and helplessness. Now imagine going through that while stranded in one of the loneliest places on Earth. That is exactly what happened to a group of Ukrainian scientists. They have been stuck at this remote research base on an Antarctic island thousands of kilometers from home. Jackson Prosko looks at their struggle away from home and their bitter task of returning to a country that has been changed forever. Perched on the edge of Antarctica sits a tiny Ukrainian outpost. This is the Vernadsky Research Center, where penguins frolic among the ice flows and where a small team of Ukrainian scientists has been trapped, helplessly watching the invasion of their country 14,000 kilometers away. Information about missile strikes and other cities shocked all of us. It's impossible to describe the feeling of helplessness in this situation. Each of us spent the first week of the war without sleep. The researchers were supposed to end their year-long expedition in February, but war left them frozen in place at the bottom of the world. Their only link to home has been satellite internet. It's slow and often stops working. What they do know is their villages and cities are being bombed. Their families and friends are in danger. We all felt the mix of emotions like anger, despair, helplessness, frustration. At a time like this, the scientists would all rather be back in Ukraine. As the situation has grown more dire, they've turned from research to outreach. On YouTube, the team appealed to their fellow Russian scientists to speak out against the invasion and they unfurled the blue and yellow flag of Ukraine in the snow with a message of solidarity. <laughs> our hearts are full of pain from what is happening in our homeland. Isolation and desperation have taken a physical toll, according to the expedition's doctor. We are quite stressed and anxious. It led to the blood pressure spikes and insomnia. Relief finally came this week when a replacement team arrived, along with a ship to take the scientists home. They still don't know how long the journey will take or what awaits them. I've come to terms with the fact that my life will never be the same. Uh, it seems that the war will be not end quickly. After war followed them to the most isolated place on the planet, they know the Ukraine they return to will be vastly different from the country they left more than a year ago. Jackson Prosco, Global News. Coming up, how traditional Easter egg art is taking on special meaning for Ukrainians in Alberta. Easter events this weekend will likely involve a long-time tradition for many Ukrainian Canadians, those vibrant, hand-painted Easter eggs. But Ukrainians who have fled war are still struggling and will be too far from the comforts of home to celebrate. That's why a Calgary artist is using the long-time holiday tradition to support those coming into Alberta. And she's hoping her prayers for peace can help. Here's Gil Tucker. These are Ukrainian Easter eggs, or what we call pissing kit, and they're a symbolism of life. And 
and rebirth. A tradition that goes back centuries. We don't paint, we use wax and dye. Veteran artist Dana Diduk sharing her talents with the crowds here at the Calgary Farmers Market. Every line, every symbol has a meaning. We've got the Ukrainian flag, we do the Tree of Life as well. They're works of art, just unbelievable. The Trezup or the Trident, so that's the national symbol of Ukraine. And this Easter, those symbols are more important than ever. We're doing prayers for Ukraine, for peace, send our love to Ukraine. Dane is also working to welcome people fleeing the fighting. Right now we're doing a ton of fundraisers. One of them is at this mall. It's called Pisanki for Peace. Dana and other artists are auctioning off their work online, raising money to support Ukrainians coming to Alberta, getting a bit of help from some kids. They put their hands there, letting them know that they can do something to raise awareness for what is going on and also support a Ukrainian families and help other kids. It's fantastic that uh, artisans are, are getting together and using their craft to try and help the people of Ukraine. Dana was in Ukraine three years ago. My heritage is Ukrainian, my blood's Ukrainian. Developing her skills alongside artists there. One of which is actually fighting in the war. Other Pisanka artists that we know in Ukraine right now, they're weaving the camouflage nets for the fighters and doing everything that they can to help. Well, Dana does her part here. The stag for Zelensky, for strength. Symbols on a small scale out to make a big difference. Put in our love and put in our prayers. Bill Tucker, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. We'll leave you with another artist's tribute to Ukrainians. Toronto artist Mahyar Amiri painted this mural featuring a child with a Ukrainian flag while holding a very fitting message. Amiri says it's because children represent purity and have no hate or greed in them. There's another much larger section to the piece with a more vulgar message aimed at Vladimir Putin. Here's a hint. It involves the F word. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.